Hello, welcome back to Educate Ebony, the metal edition. I'm Ebony, and do you follow me on socials yet? You should, it's a good time. I'm under Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as at Educate Ebony, and there you can see all the listening notes for each episode. And last week, I spoke to Max Cavalera. That was a pretty big episode for me. It was pretty cool. He's a huge name in the metal scene, and he told me to listen to a Judas Priest album, British Steel to be exact, and I, I did, but I procrastinated a lot, not because I didn't want to listen to the album, but because for his listening notes, he said I had to put on my leather, dress up like a rock star, grab a broom and air guitar in front of a mirror. And knowing that I have to take some photos and take a little video of my listening notes for you guys, that was terrifying for me. I'm not a performative person at all. <laughs> so I did put this off for a long time, but it was actually fun. Yeah, when I got around to it, when I actually did it. It was a lot of fun. I think British Steel is just a fun album. Can I say that about Judas Priest? They're just classic metal, but it was a fun album to listen to. And I can see why Max was like, get in the mood, have a bit of fun. So I'm I'm glad I did. I reckon that Steeler was a pretty, pretty good song. And so was You Don't Have to Be Old to Be Wise. I like those two. Probably the best, just because I think they had something a little bit extra, maybe some cooler riffs or guitar solos. I don't know, something that I just really clicked with. And um, Breaking the Law, of course, that's a classic track. And that was, yeah, definitely cool <laughs> to hear. I probably should have listened to it a lot sooner than I did, but a good album. So thank you to Max Cavalera. But let's get to it. This week on Educate Ebony, I'm excited to introduce Chris Marrick. He is an industry veteran who owns and operates Marrick Media, which is a globally focused music and entertainment company. You know, you're an emerging musician and want some advice about campaigns and stuff? You go to Chris. You want a full-blown PR campaign to boost your exposure? You go to Chris. You want anything else like marketing, distribution? Uh, Well, I I think you get it by now, but Chris is you guys. So, Chris, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very, very much for having me. And uh, yeah, it's nice to know I'm the go-to guy for so many things. Oh, definitely. Of course. You've been in the industry, what, 20 plus years? Yeah. it's uh, It seems like more than often I'm adding an extra year to the thing in the bio. Oh, a 22-year veteran, 23-year <laughs> veteran. And it's like, okay, we can stop that. But uh, yeah, been around a long time. We were just discussing before you uh, hit record just some of the stuff that I was doing, which feels like yesterday to me, but was 20 plus years ago. And you're like, wow, you know. You were, you were around when that band was a demo band and now they're a big band. And it's, it's just a, it's a weird thing to kind of compartmentalize and get a grip on when you've been doing it your whole working life. Yeah, literally. You know, you've obviously worked with really cool bands and labels and stuff, but do you have like a favorite campaign that you've run or clients that you were like super stoked to work with? Yeah, I mean... Not to, not to name favorites or anything, but name favorites. I <laughs> know, uh, the name dropping thing. I don't think I have a box of spoons big enough to and that's the name of the Um <laughs> But it kind of peaked early. Look, I, I was at Universal when I was about 23, 24, and I worked on the Sonanga album from Metallica. And I got into this basically because of the Black album came out when I was in year nine, in 91. I was already a fan before that that came across. But, um, you know, I started as like Bon Jovi and Motley Crue and what can be heavier and what can be heavier and on and on went. But, you know, the Metallica album was basically my poison and to work with those guys you know when they came out and toured i think they toured 2004 for the big day out they played sydney twice and all that sort of stuff and and to actually spend a couple of days with them i totally fanboyed out i've worked with so many people that i've you know forgotten but when i I really lost it was in front of lars and in front of james and i didn't really kind of turn to butter or anything like that but i was just a bit too excited asking too many questions and being a little (laughs) bit you know i got told later on just contain yourself reel it in um be cool but it was like, hey, you know, when you get into the industry because of a particular thing and that that person is standing in front of you, it was like, hey, you know, and I, and I say it's like I got to tell Lars and Stephen Adler, two of my favorite drummers, my drumming style is a combination of the two of them. And I got to tell that to both of them to their face. And that's that's amazing. That's one of my favorite stories. It's like not many people get to do that. Yeah. And to have them both go, that's awesome, and know about the other one. I'm like, you and Steve or, you know, you and Lars. And they're like, that's rad, excellent, good stuff. So, yeah, it wasn't really a, a campaign. I mean, it was an art <laughs> album to promote, let me tell you, this an anger album. Yeah. I actually remember being in the boardroom when they brought the CD in from the US and everyone's excited. There's a $100,000 plus stereo in the boardroom and they press play and everyone's looking at me because I'm Mr. Metallica. And I'm just looking at the floor going, there's, there's something wrong with the speakers because I don't know if you've heard the album, it sounds like, you know, a backyard alley 
banging around and the snare's horrible and there was jokes about it for years and all this sort of stuff. And I'm like, there's something sonically wrong oh, no. with the stereo. <laughs> I can't say anything. I just have to smile and nod and I'm like, the songs are a bit uh, as well. Let that go. Worry about the sound. And then I think I said, oh, you know, in about two weeks I'll get a, a CD copy of my own and I'll listen to it in the car and my car had a, a, a really good system in it. And I'm like, I'll hear what it really sounds like. And then that day came and I put the CD in and it sounded exactly the same. And I'm like, oh, no, this, <laughs> this is what it is. It's shit. And, uh, you know, the rest is history, kind of. <laughs> and still got feature album on Triple J, though, that week. So, you know, that that's a feather in my cap. I haven't had a feature album on Triple J for years, but uh, that was one of them. That's awesome. And I know you're going to go for something old school, so I'm excited. So lay it on me. What is the one metal album I need to hear? Yeah, I think you need to hear Twilight of the Gods by Bathory. Twilight of the Gods. Who is Bathory? This is something from before I was born, is it? Yeah. What year? <laughs> 91. Yep. I'm not going to ask how old you are, but there well, you go. You've... two years before me. Okay. Well, I mean, it came out the same year that uh, the, the Black Album came out. I just I can't remember the exact release date, though, but, you know, 91, seminal year for me for music is so much. Well, that whole sort of 89 to 92 was so prolific with metal. Yeah. Um, Bathory were a Swedish band. It was pretty much a one-man operation uh, by a guy that went under the name of Quorthen, and he single-handedly gave birth to more than one metal genre. Oh, what? I, I will have the purists debate me, I'm, I'm sure, I know. But before this album came out, Bathory started in 84 with a self-titled album, which was pretty much a Venom slash Motorhead ripoff. You know, even Venom creating black metal with the black metal album is debatable. Oh. But, you know, the first Bathory album was a straight up copy of that. If you put it on, you really can't tell the difference between Venom and early Motorhead. It's got that kind of, you know, punk on speed kind of black metal, horrible production, great songs though, really, really good. And you've no doubt, if, you know, more people have probably seen a Bathory shirt than they realise, you know, with the goat with the pentagram. Oh, and yes. Bathory's in old English script with it looks like it says Batlord oh. and that was the running gag. Oh, that's Bathory, right? So Bathory from 84 up until 88, 87. I had three black metal albums. Mm. And then, yeah, 80, 87 was the last one. So um, in 88, he made uh, the first of what was going to become a trilogy of what well, we call them the Viking trilogy albums with Bloodfire Death. Now, Bloodfire Death moved away from the black metal traditional sound to this more grandiose um, longer songs, epic sort of storytelling, Viking mythology kind of thing. And he was the, really the first band to kind of do that. You know, there was bands that were doing that, like, you know, Maiden and Saxon and all that sort of stuff before. But to really create a soundscape that sounded like the soundtrack to a Viking group, you know, Viking raid, uh, that started with Bloodfire Death. You know, there's, wow. there's still some of that old school black metal in there, but it's a little bit more deathy. But you know, it starts with Odin's ride over Nordland, which is horses neighing and and this kind of angelic choir in the background and some acoustic guitars, and then and then it comes in. It's pretty much the proto um, template for the bands like Opeth and and all of that kind of stuff who have those massive production songs. You know, he kind of kicked that off, and then that moved into another album um, called Hammerheart, which came out in 1990, and that dialed back the metal even more and upped the classical influence, lots of guitars, uh, lots of acoustic layering, less deathy, blacky vocals and more clean singing. Again, songs are like 11 minutes, 10 minutes, 24, you know, huge kind of songs. That's massive. And it kind of culminated in 91 with Twilight of the Gods, which is, you know, out of all of those three kind of Viking-themed albums, it's my favourite. Other people have theirs and, and for good reason. It's like... Again, Twilight of the Gods, the title track's 14 minutes long. Um, out of that, there's probably eight minutes of song and six minutes of interlude and, and outro with acoustic guitars. But again, same kind of formula, just this epic intros, guitars, wind. You feel like you're on a mountain in Norway or in Sweden in this case, you know, with the wind in your hair and a sword and on a horse and you're about to go charging into battle. It's exactly what this sounds like. And if you look at the album covers that's exactly what it looks like too, you know. So when I first heard that, it was on Three Hours of Power, which is the racket. You know, oh, the racket's right. gone by many names over the years. It started out as the Two Hours of Power. Oh, wow. Yeah, you know, I was listening to that at school and then it moved into the Three Hours of Power with Helen Razor, who was, you know, Triple J 
morning host with Mikey Robbins for years and, you know, she was my introduction to so much metal and I remember hearing this song and I used to tape this stuff off the radio and was just like, what is this? Because there's so many parts to it. There's so much intrinsic detail to it and then at the end, you know, there's this big kind of acoustic outro and I just remember her coming in over the top of it going, oh, so beautiful, Bathory. And I'm like, Bathory, I'll write that down, you know. And then, and then when I realised it was the same band, I'm like, what? So, wow, okay. But, yeah, that was kind of the intro to it and then, uh, you know, getting into it, it's a, it's a long journey. Like we are talking before about having to immerse yourself in an album. Yeah. This is not an album where it's just 10 songs, they're all bangers, there's none of that. You know, it's just every piece. It does flow as an album, but every piece can totally stand on its own. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to, you know, not really dissecting but getting into all of those songs with you as we go. Yeah. Well, if this is your favourite of the three Viking uh, albums, why this one? What makes this album so great compared to the other ones? I think it was the timing. It was the first album that that came out while I was a fan. Oh, okay. You know, the other two, you know, I was 30, 14 when this came out. The other two, you know, would have scared the shit out of me as a 10-year-old. <laughs> um, fair enough. I remember seeing Overkill's The Years of Decay album cover in Brashes when I was about that age, 11 or 12, and it was this big skull with, like, fire coming out of it and all this skin. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I like Bon Jovi, and even that's a bit hard for me. Um, <laughs> you know, I was 10 or 11. So getting into this kind of stuff, like, you you know, year nine at school, year eight, year eight and nine were very developmental as far as getting into the heavier stuff goes. So, yeah, and it was on the radio. It was kind of the first one that was promoted in real time to me. The album cover, it's just, uh, you know, it's mountains and fire. It looks very Lord of the Rings kind of thing with, you know, a big bright, you know, sort of sun in the background and, and a river in front and everything about it. Like, the Viking metal wasn't a thing, right? In 91, it was like thrash Metallica, there was hard rock, there was, you know, Sepultura and bands like that. And it was like, I don't even think this had a name as in Viking Metal. It was just like epic. What is this like? You know, and I remember going to Utopia, which was on Clarence Street at the time in the city, going, give me more of this. I want bands that sound like this. Can you, can you show me? And the best the guy could come up with was like Manowar. And I'm like, no, that's that's a joke compared to this. Sorry to all the Manowar fans. <laughs> um, but that's kind of like the Spinal Tap version of Viking Metal, let's face it. So, yeah, it was like, and everything about it right then at that right age, I was into, you know, the movies that kind of went along with that and Conan the Destroyer and Conan the Barbarian. It was the soundtrack to that. It just made you feel like you were 15 feet tall. And, but because the covers got, you know, all of the covers were kind of epic paintings like that. Every time, because it wasn't just me, it was a bunch of mates that were into this sort of stuff as well. We were the big Westies at school. Every time there was an epic sunset or rain or something like that. It's like, it's a Bathory sky. Oh. You know, every time you see a sunset that lasts for like an hour, it's like put on the Bathory because it goes with that. That's poetic. It is. It's totally poetic. I mean, there's actually a quote from Nietzsche on the back of the album on the, on the inside of the CD sleeve, which is the Twilight of the Gods, which was a, a piece that he wrote. But it's really funny because the actual song lyrics for the title track, nothing to do with Vikings at all. It's all about corruption and government, and New World Order and all that sort of stuff. So it could have been a ministry song. But it was just the way it was delivered. You know, the other songs go into it completely, like Under the Runes and Bond of Blood and all that. They are total Viking songs. But Twilight of the Gods was quite modern political in its time because, you know, 91, you know, Eastern Europe had just dissolved and all of that kind of stuff. So it was still quite fresh. Yeah. Even though he was from Sweden. And that was the other thing about Bathory. It was a complete mystery. The Bloodfire Death album had a photo, an insert with him and his mates, and they had all these crazy names, standing in, like, you know, leather undies with swords like they were Conan, but they were super skinny. They weren't muscly at all. But that was fake because there was no band. It was him. You know, his father ran the label, Blackmark. His name was Boss, and they produced the albums themselves. He played all the stuff. I mean, the drums on the Twilight of the Gods is basically a drum machine. But here's a fun fact for you. Jonas Ackerlund, who made, remember the movie a couple of years ago, Lords of Chaos? Yes. Which was about based on the back black metal <laughs> book, right? That was cause of its own controversy. Um, anyway, Jonas was the original drummer in Bathory in the first albums. Ah. He went on to produce you know, a whole bunch of video clips from Madonna and Lady Gaga and all this kind of stuff and kind of infiltrated into the LA elite. And it's like, yes, wow. there's someone from fucking Bathory making videos for Madonna. Like that doesn't get any more surreptitious than that. <laughs> That was awesome. It's like, you know, this guy who's, who knows real stuff and he's running around with these people. It's like, that's awesome. How interesting. Yeah. So by the time you got to this, it was just, 
this mystique around them. There was no promo photos. He did like one interview. He never toured. There's hardly any vision of Cawthon on YouTube. You know, unfortunately, he, he passed away. He passed away on June 4, I think it was 2004. I mean, there's an, a massive catalogue of stuff which we can kind of cover, but this particular album was the pinnacle for me. But, yeah, everything about it, the mystery, you know, the Viking kind of themes, the, the sunset, the, the music itself, like you said, poetic sort of package that it kind of brought to you. And, yeah, as a 14-year-old kid living in the western suburbs of Sydney, it was like this was as far away from Campbelltown Station as you could get. <laughs> Literally. Also, when you first find an album or a song or a band, you get really obsessed and I would listen to it on repeat for however long I needed to, but then you forget about it for a while and you come back. When did it actually become important to you? Like you realised, oh, this wasn't just a little obsession. This is the band that I'm going to listen to forever. From the get-go, to be honest, like, and to be quite fair, I've been searching for a successor to this album since and it's 30 years old and nothing's come close. Wow. You know, I'm wearing a Solstice Fear hoodie right now. They're from Iceland. All of those bands that sprung up because of it, every Viking band from Amonamath to Enslaved to, you know, everything in Scandinavia owes a massive debt to this band. They all know it. Uh, even the black metal guys that came after this sort of stuff, because this is pre that kind of stuff, pre Emperor, pre Dark Throne, all of those, Satyricon, all of those kind of bands will cite Bathory as an influence one way or another, whether it's Viking or black metal or both. Wow. You know, that's how important this band was because it was also the first time it actually took it to the world. It was outside of, you know, like Steve Hughes, the Australian comedian, Steve, who played in Slaughter Lord and, and Mortal Sin for a bit there. You know, he used to, he told me something that was just made me so envious of him that he was actually a pen pal of Cawthon's in like the early eighties. And I was like, okay, that doesn't even sound like it would work. How do you actually even know about a guy who lives, he doesn't live in Stockholm. He lives in like regional Sweden. How are you conversing with this guy and you're from Blacktown? That's quite amazing. And it's like he's probably not the only Australian he's ever heard of, let alone communicating with, you know. And it's like <laughs> it just added even more to that mystique. It's like, who is this guy? Because it's all pre-internet. It's pre-anything. No promo photos, no interviews, no nothing. It's just, just the music and the art and that's all you've got and that's all that will sell it. There's no five guys in leather jackets posing and it's like, which used to get me. I used to like bands because of that, right? And then you'd hear me like, oh, this shit. But Bath was completely about the music and it was like, right. So even today, I, you know, I went up to the shops. It's two degrees up here in the Blue Mountains and I put this on and I'm like, this is the weather for it. This makes you feel like you're back in the Middle Ages or back in the Viking era with, you know, the Swedish winds tearing through your hair. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's from 44 years old and it still, it still gives me the same feelings as it did when I was 14. So, you know, it's just an incredible album and it still does top like the essentials lists on so many different websites not that those things carry much weight but you know what i mean it's like it's an iconic classic record for all of these reasons and it's not just because of sales it probably sold like shit but it's a cult record that's for sure you know obviously you've been in the music industry a long time and big listener of this sort of metal for me because i haven't listened to black metal or death metal or viking metal a lot is there an aspect of this album that you think we need to know about that you hear and maybe us regular listeners wouldn't hear or wouldn't know about? The musicality of it, I think. It's not like, you know, like Modern Marth is a Viking band, but they are all about the Viking. Every single song is some Viking Norse mythology kind of lyric, but it's straight up death metal. It sounds like Moving Mountains. It's epic. It's humongous. They've got the riffs for days and all that sort of stuff. This is a different kind of sledgehammer where Under the Runes has got a really big pounding riff to it. Plus, it's also 30 years ago, so the production's not as in your face, and they did it themselves. But the intricacy of it, like I said, Twilight of the Gods, the track that opens it, well, the first three tracks really could be loosely construed as one massive song, which goes for like half an hour. Twilight of the Gods, Through Blood by Thunder, and Blood and Iron, they all kind of have this theme running through it. And then it switches gears with the last four songs, Under the Runes kind of creates a kind of definite break because it just kicks in with this riff. But the first three... Very similar acoustic intro and outros and all that kind of stuff and a build and then passages that go through. And just I was listening to the, the acoustic again today and it's all just, it's like, I think it's a step down, so it's in D, which creates that somber kind of mood. And it's just his ability as an acoustic guitar player is incredible because it's not really basic, obvious sort of stuff. You know, a lot of metal, like, you know, basically all of Metallica's ballads are the same three chords just plucked differently. You know, fade to black is the same as 
unforgiven is the same as one and all of that kind of stuff. It's just the way they arrange it. But this sort of stuff, it's like there's just parts of classical and there's a little bit of flamenco in there and he's a completely self-taught guy. And it's wow. like, how does acoustic guitar was not a Viking instrument. I guess it's with the extra production, the wind and, you know, the way that it builds and, and it ebbs and flows like that. Those kind of little parts are the flourishes that kind of pull it all together and you're kind of going, okay, that's what gets me. And you know that it's kind of come and it's going to build and then it's going to turn into this really cinematic kind of explosion when the, when the drums kick in and all that. But it's not because it is clean singing as well. It doesn't overpower that. It's not the best singer in the world by any stretch. Um, but, you, you know, it's, it's heartfelt and it's got this emotion to it because it's like, you know, he's telling a story as a Viking, as a warrior to another, blood on iron, you know, um, Bond of Blood is about, you know, this Viking character leaving the shores, sister, you know, for my return, sing, I'll be gone, I'm off on a Viking raid, you know, and mother and father and brother and all that kind of stuff. And it's like heading north after a long journey, we're coming home. And it's like, and you can hear the oars, like they actually have the sample of the of the Viking oars in the water underneath what? the acoustic while the vocals are singing. And there's a lot of gang vocals in there too, like those kind of multi-layered queen kind of vocals that just make it sound choral, you know, and it's all him. He's just multi-layering his own voice, but he's really good at harmonising himself. So that's the thing. It's like, what does Viking metal sound like? Well, in the beginning it sounded like this. And like I said, nothing comes close there's been everything everything kind of if there was a family tree this wouldn't be the root of it but it would certainly be one of the major branches and everything else that's come kind of after even bands like emperor and stuff like that some of the some of the interludes and, and intricacies directly come from this so that's one of the things it's like the musicality is really really it's understated on how good it is but when you actually listen to it you're like wow, the playing on this is amazing, except for the drums because they're all programmed and a lot of it's out of time. <laughs> <laughs> so this is just one guy, though, as in, like, he's there doing the guitar, doing the other stuff, and then just chucking it, it all together. Yeah. There was um, – so after this album, he kind of went back to, like, three albums of phoning in black metal – death metal stuff, which was really disappointing for a lot of fans because it was like, you, you Twilight of the Gods, you can't mess with that. And then you come out with that shit. But in 96, he released Blood on Ice, which was meant to be almost like in between Hammerheart and Twilight of the Gods around that time, but it just got put on ice kind of thing. And the, and the artwork is ridiculous because there's a guy that looks like Gandalf in there sort of, and there's wolves and, and forests and a sword with shit on it. And all this very, very Conan-y. That is nowhere near as good as Twilight. And it's actually a little bit more straight up in its heavy metal approach. But what pissed a lot of fans off was the inside. He basically gave, he blew the mystery open on Bathory. Oh. It's me and my dad. I was recording the lyric. I was, I was singing the song, this song, uh, which everyone thinks I, I went out into the forest and recorded it amongst the Ravens. I was singing it in the toilet, standing between two tires. And if you listen very closely, you can hear an airplane <laughs> flying past. And you're like, no, no, why did you just ruin it for everybody? Like, don't shatter the illusion. You're you're this mythical guy that lives in a castle grayscale up in the mountain, and I, that, and I will not believe otherwise. That's the kind of level of bullshit that we we bought into with this record. And then for him to undo it like that, I was like, oh come on, you know, like. But it was kind of I love that sort of stuff anyway. It's kind of like, well, you know, here's how we recorded it, and it sounds crap because it was crap. I mean. Not crap, but it certainly does not sound like the Black Album, which was polished and spent a million dollars on production. And then after that, in 2002 and 2003, which, which ended up being the final recording, was Nordland 1 and 2, which was a double album of more of the back to the Viking kind of thing. But by that stage, it was kind of simpler songs and a culmination of every bit of his stuff. So it didn't land as much as Twilight and the other albums did. But it was a nice way to sort of tie it all down if you know what I mean like I don't know I couldn't tell you those songs you know whereas this one I, w I know every song well obviously it stands up you know still to this year 2021 yeah. do you reckon that pirate metal came from viking metal um which came first it's like the chicken or the egg no no absolutely viking metal came first I think pirate metal is only, it's like a post-millennial thing post-millennial um, <laughs> I can't think of an example of pirate metal before kind of Ailstorm started that whole thing really um there might have been a song here and there, 
But as far as a movement with the wenches and the thing and the ho, ho, ho and a bottle of rum, that kind of swagger kind of thing, it's completely different. You know, I don't think it has any, it's got more in touch with kind of. Like sea shanties or whatever. Yeah. I mean, that whole folk metal thing is probably the bridge between Viking metal and pirate metal, if you will, because a lot of the folk stuff, there's some amazing bands coming out of Russia right now as well, if you want to go down that route. Oh, wow. Because I, I think they've been unaffected by Western influence with that metal stuff. They're not trying to be, you know, Slayer or anything like that. They've come up with their, and a lot of it is traditional folk elements as well. And that's why there's all of those, you know, um, like Drutk from uh, Ukraine. You know, it's black metal, but it's pagan metal and it's folk metal and it uses a lot of those Balkan kind of sounds and melodies. You know, this is a lot of what, which is, you know, I love, deep diving into this kind of stuff, especially the black metal, the extended black metal thing, because it does incorporate so much of the traditional European folk melodies. It's not just sort of sounding like Viking stuff. He uses traditional Swedish tunes, you know. Right. It's like it's like the Braveheart soundtrack, you know, with bagpipes and all that sort of stuff if they just put guitars under it, kind of. Yeah. You know, oh. That's an easy way and it's a cheap way to describe it, but, you know, as a quick... Thing. This is what it sounds like. But um, yeah, I think all of those elements, you know, like pirate metal does kind of lean on the gimmick a little bit. Mm, yeah. Oh, yeah. Whereas this was this was done with a straight face and all the better for it because if it wasn't, I, I think it would have, people from the outside probably thought it was a joke, but, you know, everyone on the inside was like, this is literally what Eric the Red would have, him and his band would have sounded like. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> That'd be the, I don't know if you've watched um the show Vikings. Great show. Yeah. A friend of mine does the music for it. What? How do you know these people? <laughs> Ina Selvig, you've heard of Wardruna, I'm sure. I don't think so. <laughs> no? Okay, let's back up there. So Wardruna are a band from Norway uh, who are completely into Nordic folk, like to the point where metalheads like it because, well, they resonate to it because Ina was in Gorgoroth back in the day. So he came from black metal roots, but, you know, Wardruna sounds nothing like that. It's like the rise of bands like them and The Who from Mongolia, where it's traditional folk kind of music kind of stuff. Wardruna is all instruments from the Viking age. Like he actually went in, before he started this concept a few years ago, he left his house in Bergen and went into the woods for a year to communicate with nature, learn and, and make the instruments out of the trees. Okay, so this particular instrument, whatever it's called, traditionally was made from the birch tree and they aged it and dried it and turned it into this and they got the skin of this animal and made it and so he went and did that. Whoa. So Wardruna on stage looks like they're straight out of Assassin's Creed Valhalla, which he also did some of the music for. Damn. You know, it's a complete subculture. So, like, you look at them on stage, one of the best gigs I ever saw was them playing in a Roman amphitheatre in Switzerland in 2019 which was 2,000 years old. They look like they're 1,000 years old and it was pissing down with rain and it was thundering and lightning and all that sort of stuff. And I spoke to the drummer afterwards. He's not really a drummer. He's got like drums here around his feet and he kind of does, you know, kind of beats out of them. There's no drum kit. Uh, and there's a female singer and there's a guy playing one of those huge kind of cow foghorn things, which is 10 feet big. And they were like, I'm like, oh man, it kind of sucked about the rain because I was watching from the soundboard, but I was still getting wet. And I go, no, are you kidding? That was amazing. Like the thunder and the lightning was cracking and it was like, we're playing as the best gig ever. And I was like, yes, that's the kind of closest feeling I would ever get to having Bathory play live, which they never did. Yeah. So Ina, yeah, I mean, Wardruna is a cult thing. They're selling out, you know, 10,000 seaters in New York and stuff like this. So yeah, that kind of music that the Vikings soundtrack sounds like, that's what Wardruna sounds like, more or less. That's so cool. Because he writes the same stuff. So it's kind of got that tribal drumming, a lot of echoey vocals that sound like they're recorded in the room down the hall, like distant kind of thing, and that emotive kind of feeling. So that's kind of the evolution of Bathory, I would say. You know, there's not much tying the two together, but you can see a direct path between them. Oh, I think I'm going to have to go down like a um, Viking metal deep dark hole now because that sounds like there's a lot <laughs> there's actually a lot yeah, yeah you go to any european uh metal festival and half the people look like they're extras out of vikings and um i'm there so this is why because i think also because culturally you know when metal was kind of starting in the 80s and all that sort of stuff the brits you know well in the 70s with sabbath and stuff like that that was their thing mm. metal you know germans like creator and, and sodom and that they had the thrash but this was distinctly European culture specific. Yeah. Vikings. We were Vikings, Scandinavian, for, you know, more specifically, we were Vikings. 
this is our indigenous music in a way, but yeah. with metal behind it. And that's that's you've seen that in the last 20 years, this massive return to the kind of pagan heritage of those countries. People are sort of ditching, you know, the traditional Christian ways. And when you listen to them, they're like, we're not ditching anything. We're reclaiming what was ours originally. You know, yeah. Paganism was here first. Viking, you know, Odinism and all of that kind of stuff was here first. The Christians came and burned all our churches down. So we just took them back. Yeah. And, you know, there's there's a huge uprising in those like Nordic, Norse kind of ways of life, but also just secular as well, ditching, you know, kind of Christianity in a, in a way. And this is the thing. It's not a satanic thing or anything. And that was all a bit of theatre with the black metal stuff. This is more a, this is our real heritage. We're in touch with nature. We're out in the woods around a bonfire singing and connecting with each other and connecting with the gods and all of that kind of stuff. So it's really primal. It's interesting because uh, someone who's not in the metal scene or the heavy scene, they would not see metal as like connecting with nature and <laughs> back to the roots. So it's, it's really cool to hear and it's yeah. something to learn about for sure. Well, it's funny you say back to the roots because it kind of does what Sepultura's roots did for their culture. You know, with Brazilian, they kind of mixed the metal with the indigenous Brazilian music. This is no different. Yeah, definitely. Well, as a very heavy album in all aspects, what are my listening notes? How should I listen to this album? I I think just in the dark. <laughs> no, uh, if, <laughs> in if the dark can, at midnight. You, well, no, if you at sunset, if you can take, if you can get this in the car and go for a, a highway cruise that you're not going to stop for an hour and a half, do that. Otherwise, sit in a room with a candle and just turn it on. It doesn't have to be blaring or anything like that, but it, you know those acoustic parts are quite low in the mix. Or just sit there with headphones on and maybe, you know, read a book about Vikings because it is that kind of, you know, yes, you can read along to the lyrics. You don't really have to, but it's good because you do get a sense of the story, especially in some of the more Viking themed songs. Oh, and it, and it finishes. So you have uh, seven songs. Twilight is like 14 minutes through Blood by Thunder, which is almost an extension of that. He's only six. And then Blood and Iron is 10 minutes, 25. So that's kind of like part one. Yeah. Part two, Under the Runes is a banger. It's 5.57, so it's almost a speed song. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's about being, you know, I actually listened to that song in Ireland when we were there in 2019 in a field of ancient stones, like you know, an Irish stone circle, which was 3,000 years old. And I'm, my wife was going, what are you doing? I'm like, go over there. I'm listening to Under the Runes and I'm having a moment. I just, I just need to be spiritual for a moment yeah. to, to Bathory. <laughs> I tell you what, like the first time I went to Norway, in 2006, I was listening to Bathory and I was listening to Watain and even Devon Townsend while I was on a boat doing a fjord cruise and the fjords were up. It was minus 25 on deck. And I was like, this sounds like what I'm looking at. It actually sounded different because it's like, you know, you're listening to it from Australia and it's like, well, I'm looking at gum trees. This doesn't connect. But when you're there and there's like mountains that are scraping the sky and it's freezing cold and you're in free and there's a Norwegian flag there, you're like, I get it now because this has to sound like that because this is what it is. And it was that kind of feeling again in Ireland with Under the Runes. And I was like, yeah, it makes you feel like so incredibly powerful and connected and all that sort of stuff. And then the rest of the album, you know, To Enter Your Mountain uh, and Bond of Blood are kind of two more similar songs to Under the Runes and that they're just kind of pretty straight as far as the bathroom song goes. And then it closes out with Hammerheart, which uh, is incidentally, you know, the name of the previous album, but it's actually a piece called The Planets by Gustav Holst, which is a German composer. And if you've heard, the, as soon as you hear the song, you go, I know that song. Like it's a piece of music that's been used in heaps of commercials and all that sort of stuff. It's a very famous classical piece, but he's just put lyrics, he's sung lyrics over the top of it. There's the tiniest little guitar break at the end and big timpanis that kind of round it out so it sounds like you've just finished a symphony yeah, heart, you know like that Doing, and it's like an end of a cinema score and then it just ends and kind of just drifts off with more wind and you're like right you can take your headphones off now and you're like what the hell did i just listen to so it's a really good finisher and it's you know it starts strong finishes strong kind of thing well it doesn't start strong it takes about five minutes to start um, <laughs> <laughs> the acoustics, and you have to actually go, is it actually on? I need to crank it because it's just peaking so softly. The wind's louder than the acoustic part. But, yeah, so Hammer Heart is not a song rather than a piece of classical music with some lyrics on it. But, yeah, I, I wouldn't imagine this thing rounding out any other way. So I don't, I don't know what it runs for, but an hour, probably more. You can 
jump in at any particular song if you wanted to, but I think to get the full experience, it's start a start to finish. It's yeah. start to finish the record for sure. Amazing. Well, <laughs> there we have it. The one metal album that Chris Marrick thinks that you and I should listen to is Twilight of the Gods by Bathory. Thank you so much for your wisdom. I can't wait to listen to it from your point of view. You're very welcome. I'm very keen to hear what you think of it too. And uh, if I've completely told a false lie or you you actually think it's as amazing as I do as well. Yeah, I'll let you know. It sounds great. I'm excited to listen to it in the dark with a candle. I think that sounds, <laughs> that sounds poetic and I think that fits. So that's yeah, what I'm going to do. My iTunes is so organized. 25,949 songs in there. Four or five years ago, I literally started at the top A and press play and listen to every single song in my iTunes. Took 18 months. 18 like, months? Not, well, I wasn't non-stop. Like if I listened to everything, like if I press play and walked away right now, it would take 100 well, 99.7 days to play right through. Yeah. <laughs> There's that much shit in there. 